Hi everyone, thanks for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff, and I'll be your host for the show. If you've had a Dogman Encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. Tonight's guest is Dave Lighty. Dave, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Please give us a brief bio on yourself. Well, I'm 55 years old, married with no children. I'm a retired IT professional with some dog training background. I was born and raised in the Philadelphia area, and I live there half the year and spend the balance of the year in Vermont. I have had some contact with paranormal here and there with at least one Bigfoot encounter and a few possible brushes with a ghost or two. I have and, and continue to spend a lot of time outdoors hiking and camping and hunting and fishing. I was a Boy Scout and was involved in a few outdoor clubs, and I've also done some urban exploration. I'm very much at home in the woods, and I've solo camped just about all over the country, but mostly on the East Coast. I've got to tell you, Dave, after hearing all the things you've done and hearing about all the things you've been through, you definitely haven't had a boring life. (laughs) Well, that's a good thing. (laughs) I'd say so. (laughs) You've researched various paranormal topics over the years. Please tell us about the research you've done. Well, the topic always interested me about different animals than the norm and different things out there. I would read up on it as much as I could and, you know, with the internet, check the internet and talk to people who were involved in it, which I had found out whether they were or not through various research. And once an idea interests me, I I tend to follow it pretty closely. And if I can't get to the information I need just through reading it, I try to experience it as well. And so I've really checked out the Bigfoot encounter issue and I've uh, gone into um, some of the paranormal as far as the ghost phenomenon and just wanted to find out all I could about it, and then I was able to draw my own conclusions. From talking with you in the pre-interview and other times, I'm convinced that you do have the right kind of mind that a researcher would want to have for investigating these things. So if you do decide to jump into this, which from our talks before we got underway here, it sounds like you have an interest in becoming a researcher for the North America Dogman Project, I've got no doubts that you're going to do really well at that. Thanks. I was impressed with their website and some of the things I had heard about it. And I think that you really need to have an open mind going into anything, but also you need to have a good sense of discipline and control when dealing with anything, but so much more so with the unknown. Oh, I couldn't agree more. I think you're right on the money. When you camped in the Daniel Webster National Forest in the New Jersey Pine Barrens, both places creeped you out. What happened in those places that made you feel that way? Well, I had done a lot of solo camping, and I was still doing that with hiking involved or not, backpacking into remote areas. And I never really uh, felt uncomfortable doing that. But those two places, for some reason, really gave me a hard time. You know, you go in and set up camp and go about normal routines. And as you settle in toward the end of the evening, and as I did at these places, I'm used to a lot of animal noise and, and, you know, even possibly the occasional eyes looking at you from the bushes. But in these particular places, what got me was the complete lack of noise. The insects stop, the noise stops, you can't hear anything at all. And I really felt in each of these places, a very profound watched feeling. And uh, being alone and in the middle of nowhere and miles from civilization, you start to really get uncomfortable about that. And yeah, the Daniel Webster Forest in Vermont, that was definitely creepy. And the Pine Barrens as well, they both had their own different feel, but it was the same level of watchfulness, I think, that really creeped me out. It is strange when you're used to having all these ambient noises that most of us are used to day in, day out, when you go out to a place like that that can be that quiet. It's kind of unnerving. Well, 
it's usually not quiet. That's the thing. You know, you have the insect noises and the animal noises and rustlings and and breaking of branches and wind in the trees and such. And and you get used to that when you're out there. And when it becomes completely silent for long stretches of time, that's when it starts to worry me. Yeah, that would shake anyone up. The next question is kind of tied into that. Before you swore off camping in a tent, you had some unsettling experiences. Please tell us about them. Well, yeah, it does tie into those places and maybe in general as far as tent camping. It never bothered me. In fact, I would sometimes camp without the tent, just a sleeping bag and maybe a cover for my head area because I enjoyed it so much being out there. But those times when I was in the tent and I was bedding down for the evening, there was a lot of other noises. There was silence in the forest, but there was a lot of noise as walking around the tent, bipedal walking, if that's the right word. Sounds like two legs, four legs, walking and circling the tent. And I started to feel that, well, maybe just a few millimeters of fabric isn't quite enough between me and the rest of this world. So I started to think that maybe I needed to get off the ground and put something harder between me and the rest of the forest. I know the night that you had that encounter with those dogmen, I know you had to be awfully glad that you had given up tent camping and you had an ear stream behind you. Thank goodness. Yeah, absolutely. In 2009, you went on an expedition with the BFRO. Did anything eventful happen? Well, that was a really nice trip. It's nice to get out into the woods and into the surrounding countryside with people, without people, and a great group of people there. And we spent a couple of nights out in some remote areas, and I think it was the last night we were just sitting around, normal camping, and while some of the other guys were out walking around, I happened to scan the surrounding forest with a thermal camera, and probably about 10 or 15 yards from where we were sitting, I saw something behind a tree. The thermal was a black-white thermal. And this was all white, so it had nothing on except its fur, and you could see the fur and the tips of it. And it was standing behind a tree and peeking out from the side and looking on either side and looking over the top of it. And I knew it couldn't be a human because of the way it looked, and I knew it that we were remote and untold where we were, so it wouldn't have been anybody on the outside. And since the thermal portrayed the shape and substance of whatever it was so well, I didn't think it was a costume of any kind. So what got me was that when it looked at me, and I saw it look right at me because there was eye shine, and there was one big round orb that flashed right at me, and I saw that, and I knew that we had made eye contact from the distance, and it got me right in the stomach. It was the first time that I think I had made that kind of contact with that kind of thing. That was pretty exciting. I mean, it was it was a little scary, but once I got over that, I thought it was pretty exciting. If anything, it made me more interested and has pointed me in the direction of cryptozoology in an all-encompassing manner because now I've learned there's not just one kind. I mean, I had heard about other things all over the world, and I didn't really give it a lot of thought here in North America, but now I believe there's more than just one entity out in North America, so we'll cover more than one thing here. Oh, sure there is. You can almost take your pick when it comes to cryptids around here anymore, (laughs) and we're finding out about new ones all the time, it sure seems like. Yeah. Later that year, you and your wife Lisa went to North Carolina, and that's when you had your dogman encounter. Please tell us how this all went down. Well... Back in 2009, it was in October, I remember the date very well, it was my 49th birthday. My wife Lisa and I were very fond of camping, and ever since we met, we have camped just about everywhere east of the Mississippi that has a national forest or a nice state park. We decided that since tent camping was a game for younger bones, we entered into the realm of travel trailers. After looking at many, we decided upon an Airstream. They are really nice and on the expensive side, but we intended to get a lot of use out of it. Well, we got a 25-footer so that we could fit into just about any campground. It has full hookups, but we never really 
used anything but the electric and hardly that. Plus, uh, we installed solar panels because we intended to dry camp 100% of the time. Well, we traded in my 250 and bought an F350 because we wanted a little more power towing the trailer. Uh, it's an old joke among Airstream owners that you have a $60,000 trailer pulled by a $50,000 truck looking for a free campsite. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, as I said, we were older now and we had more resources and decided to go that way. So we embarked on a tour of the East Coast National and State Parks that year, and we would sometimes stay for a week or two in a place, and sometimes we'd spend just a day or two moving around. And sometimes we didn't even unhook the trailer. We just pulled it around with us to use it as a resource. We both have a lot of outdoor experience. I was a Boy Scout and spent a lot of time hiking and camping, either with friends or alone. And I was pretty aware of strange things in the wilds, especially at night, but sometimes in the daylight. I had said that there were some weird places that I had visited. Most were pretty normal, but like I said, the Daniel Webster Forest in Vermont, Pine Barrens, New Jersey, just to name two, were pretty strange. Well, with my wife, we experienced nothing really that strange together, but one particular time, we decided to go to the Outer Banks of North Carolina. We had no plan, so we just kind of won it, and we traveled slowly as usual, staying at campgrounds along the way, though usually state parks, as they seem to be a bit quieter. So we made our way south, and we steered toward the coast. Now, we crossed into North Carolina from Virginia, and we saw that it was getting close to dusk, and we picked out the closest state park, which happened to be Pettigrew State Park near the uh, Pocosin Lakes National Wildlife Refuge near Phelps Lake. Uh, as it got dark, well, we passed through a couple of dark towns, and a few miles from the park, we passed through a town called Cresswell, and this was pretty dark, too. I was surprised that there weren't any lights in town. So I stopped along the road. I uncovered my off-road lights so we could see better, and we continued on. Around a corner, when we came into town, there was this big house, and as we approached, we saw about 15 people in the yard, and it was pitch dark. And before my lights came around to the scene, it must have been really dark there, and we looked at each other and thought, well, why would you hang out in the dark like that? But as we went by, they all stopped and stared at us. We went by and gave us a weird feeling, too. And as I went by, the last guy on the lawn looked at me and said, good luck. <laughs> I thought, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, that's not good. So we got our way down to Pettigrew, and we got there just as the park ranger was leaving. And there was only one other camper there, and, and they were talking together. The place was kind of wet. It had rained a bit. There weren't many trees except by the lake. It was just kind of swampy. And we asked what it was like there, and the ranger looked at the other guy, and he looked around, he was kind of nervous, and he said, okay, you know, pretty good. Uh, I promised to be back at sunrise, and he, <laughs> he seemed pretty nervous, and the other guy seemed pretty nervous, and we looked at each other and said, well, maybe we'll give this one a miss. And the other guy said, well, you're not staying? Well, neither am I. I'm not staying another night. And he got back and started breaking camp. We're thinking, oh, well, that's kind of weird. So maybe it was the right decision. So we left there, and we drove toward Roanoke Island because we figured, well, since we're so far away from really any state park or where we're going to go, maybe we'll stay in a store parking lot. We often do that. Um, since there were no other parks nearby and all that, so we're not going to boondock in the swamp, so we're going to try for something in civilization. So we headed down Route 94 and crossed the Alligator River and drove into the middle of the Alligator National Park. So that, again, having lived in Pennsylvania my whole life and camping mostly in the north, uh, the thought of large man-eating lizards were kind of new to me, and I, I felt a little uneasy just at the reality of that type of predator. So we drove through the night, and we were looking up the park on our phones, and we read about this red wolf. It was a critically endangered species that was reintroduced to the park a few years ago, and no one had seen it in a while. And we were almost to uh, Man's Harbor, which is right on the bridge over to the island, and 
we saw this dog walking toward us, and we looked at each other, and boy, didn't it look just like a red wolf? And we had just read about that, and it was just so amazing. So I'd say it was about 1 a.m., and we're almost to the ocean, probably about 10 miles out, driving along, and I hear this loud thunk on the trailer, and I thought, what a place. I really didn't want to get out here. But I decided I should take a look. So I stopped and I left the truck running. I grabbed my 357, holstered it, and walked out. I went out and I checked the truck and I checked the trailer. I didn't see anything obviously wrong. I thought maybe I just ran over a branch or something. And then I saw a dent in the trailer just below the right taillight. Well, I checked it and while I was looking at it, the hair on the back of my neck stood straight out, and all the uh, insect noises stopped. And uh, I knew about that feeling, having had that feeling before. And uh, I got a little nervous. I kind of knew that there was something near me, either staring at me or in the area, and something odd. It was kind of like a predator feeling, like a mountain lion, coyote feeling. You know what that is. So I slowly turned around, and I didn't see anything at first. And the feeling got stronger, rather uncomfortable, so I pulled the gun out. And I didn't, still didn't see anything, but I started to hear some rustling and water noises. And so I focused in the direction of that, and I saw a dark shape behind some scrub bushes. And as my sight sharpened, I saw a familiar shape. It it looked like I was looking right at one of my German shepherds. But this one was reddish black. It was very large. And it had very large ears with looked like tufts of hair sticking up. And they were both facing me like little radar dishes. And uh, it had its front paws on a rock, and it was crouching behind the rock. I noticed that one of the ears was light gray and bent over a little bit. It looked very out of place for this guy who was pretty much consistently dark everywhere else. So our eyes met. That eyes met feeling again like the one I had had before, but this time it it wasn't very pleasant. I I got a chill. And uh, what I was looking at, I thought, was the look of a hunter. No emotion. And, and that kind of scared me. It it looked to my left, uh, its right, and moved a little bit forward. And, and then it did something th- that really haunts me to this day. I saw a deer do it once, thought it was crazy then. Well, it lurched back onto its rear legs, and then there were these two distinct popping sounds as it straightened up. Well... Then I really saw him. He was he was somewhat muscular above the waist with, with hair like a mane around his shoulders. His his fur was, was reddish, though it was dark with black streaks. He had yellow predator eyes, which were I can pretty much still see as well. Pointed ears and, and his paws had fingers and, and claws on the end and very long, muscular arms. His lower half was thinner and in kind of strange canine legs, and I thought I saw a short tail. I said, wow, now, this is the stuff of nightmares. I wondered if I was really seeing this thing. And then, then it made some noise. It was a, a low growling. And, and then it looked to its right again. And I followed its gaze, and I saw another one. And uh, this one was very dark. It was on all fours and and moving to my left. And I thought, that looks like a flanking maneuver. I I think it was time to go. And uh, so the one in the front took another step, and he showed his teeth. And, And I could see them in the moonlight glinting at me. In fact, if I think about it, I can still see them. Well... I backed away toward my truck, and I glanced to my left again, and 
I still heard the other one, but I couldn't see him anymore. Well, that wasn't good. So I reached the truck backwards, and I saw that the first one had reached the road, and he had one foot or paw or whatever it was on the on the road. And uh, I took aim at him, and I fired. I, I was pretty shaken up. So I'm a pretty good shot, and uh, I was aiming at his head. But he moved at the last minute, and, I, and I'm sure that I hit him in the shoulder. It was he. He didn't react like I thought he would. Getting hit with a gun of that caliber hit. It was almost like I punched him. Nothing more. And I had the distinct feeling that I think I just made him mad. So, uh, but he did stop, and and the other one stopped. So, I used that time to get in the truck. Honestly. I don't remember getting in the truck. Uh, my wife was in there in a state of panic because of the shot and, and also because she had really never seen me frightened before and she said I was shaking. I don't remember getting in. I don't remember putting the truck in gear. I don't remember taking off, but but I was and I was moving pretty well and the truck was pretty pretty powerful as it was and always made light of the trailer load. So I looked in my mirrors and I saw one on each side of the, the truck in the road and at least another one behind each of them. And I thought, oh, no, <laughs> there's four of them. Well, they stayed with me up to about 30, 35 miles an hour. And then then they slowed down and they just veered back into the swamp and were gone. So I didn't stop or really talk until I, I crossed the bridge and got on the Roanoke. I pulled into the Menteo shopping center and I stopped. Then I looked at Lisa and, and I told her what I saw. And she said she didn't see anything, but she admitted she was looking at her phone when I was back there. Well, I'm really glad she didn't get out or she didn't see them. I don't think I would have ever gotten around the house again. I decided not to, to go into too much detail because of that. And I just told her I, I fired a warning shot at a predator. So. We were on Roanoke, and uh, we stayed in the grocery store parking lot that night. A lot of businesses allow overnight stays by truckers and campers. They figure that you'll wake up and shop in the morning, and that's usually what happens. I know that uh, Walmart and Cracker Brow and places like that, they have special parking for trailers, and they just ask that you park so that the store cameras are toward your doors overnight. So we stayed there. We, we had a pretty uneventful night, except... I had some really bad dreams about you know what. I kept seeing them really clearly in my dreams. And the thing that kept repeating in my dream, and like I said, it still bothers me, is when I think of them as the actual point in which they stand up. Maybe it's the popping sound. It, it's like an abnormal move, and they, they do it anyway. And the eyes, of course, uh, just kind of glowing yellow. Uh, I'd seen predator eyes before, but these were different. So they seemed to to run faster and maybe quieter on, on four legs from what I saw. And and they seemed to sh shift effortlessly between four legs and, and like a half crouch. But from what I saw, they seemed to have to stop completely to, to stand completely up. At least the one in front of me did. So I woke up from that in a sweat, but we went into the grocery store in the morning, and of course everybody was staring at us, but that's not unusual. So um, we got our groceries, and we came back out, and we put them in the trailer, and Lisa got in her side, and I was walking around the trailer on my side, and I saw this truck in the parking lot in front of me, and the driver had me in a dead stare, and it was decidedly unfriendly. So... There were several things I could have done at that point, so I decided to ask him what was up. And as soon as I started to talk, he, he completely fell apart and started apologizing to me. He said that I was a carbon copy of a friend of his, and he, he thought he was messing with him. And we laughed, and I asked him about the island and the surrounding area, and he told me that the normal tour stuff and told me about a couple of good restaurants. So I looked at him, and I looked at the rifle rack in the back of his truck, and I decided to ask him about the swamp. When I told him that, he kind of rocked back on his heels and looked at me. 
he looked around and he said that he thought he was the only one. Well, we proceeded to sit at the table in the camper and talk about it, and it seemed like he had exactly the same experience twice. His name was Eric. He described him right down to the bent gray ear on one of them. That was interesting. So he told me the first time he only saw one, but the second time he saw two, maybe three, and the second time he shot one. He said he hit it in the chest, and it didn't stop at all. And then he hit it in the leg, and it stopped and looked down. And then they all retreated. Maybe that's good to know. Eric said that they had displayed hunting behavior. He said that he saw them on the mainland when he was out there hunting. And he also said he doesn't go there anymore. In fact, he said that he used to hunt everywhere in and around the swamp. And it seemed to him that since this dogman thing has come around, he doesn't go hunting and he doesn't see anybody else going hunting either. So you know, we don't know. So I thought the same thing. I'd seen predators and all kinds of stuff my whole life being out there, but I never saw these guys. But then again, I never really looked for them either. You know, coyotes, bobcat, bear, mountain lion, gator snakes, cater for him. We all knew them, but we never saw these before, and they were definitely different. Uh, he told me that a friend of his was a Bigfoot researcher, and he had been out with him a couple of times, and they said they had a pretty good time doing it, and they never really felt seriously in danger. But since they started seeing Dogman, it's put a real damper on their things, and they seemed that, that it diminished their activities somewhat. So I bought them lunch, and the three of us enjoyed the lunch, and I didn't really mention it again. And then Lisa and I left, and we went to Fort Raleigh, the north end, and then we went down to Kill Devil Hills, <laughs> weird name, and uh, we checked out the Kitty Hawk first flight area. And, uh, and I started to put the whole thing out of my mind. You know, being in civilization is real good for that. And we we kept the trailer hooked up, and we acted like hermit crabs for a while out, out there and tried the trailer around with us. So we stayed one more night at Menteo, and then we drove down to the Outer Banks, and we had a great time. It's a great place. Well, we went between the seasons, and it was pretty quiet. So we drove as far as we could to road ran out and we settled down at this campground at the end called Frisco Woods. It was closed, but I called the owner and he told me to stay as long as I wanted to and that the electric was on and that was cool. It was really a nice place. We we unhooked the trailer and set up our camp and we could see the bay and the ocean at the same time. I had a pretty good time and I was wary of the alligators, of course, and I had the dogmen in the back of my mind, but it didn't seem to be any predators on the outer bank. So we stayed for about a week and we headed back. Unless you take a ferry, there's really only one way on and off of the islands. Right before we left the area, we dry camped and hooked up one more time. We were off of Roanoke and onto the mainland near Man's Harbor. And we stayed at a nameless business there on Ferry Dock Road. And uh, we didn't really venture out after dark. Before we went in, the owner told us that we should stay inside after midnight and didn't say anything else, so he didn't have to tell me. So in the middle of the night, I got up and decided to look outside. Never a good idea to look outside in the middle of the night, but I did it anyway because I thought I heard some stealthy movement outside. I didn't see anything. But I did, before I went back, thought I saw two eyes on the edge of the woods. And, of course, the insect stopped again. They were about maybe four or six feet off the ground, I could say, from where I was. I could have been wrong. But after a while, they were gone. And the noise started again. If it had been any other time, I would have dismissed it as totally normal. But since the events of the week before, I was really nervous now. So in the morning, we woke up, we thanked the guy, and we hit the road. And there, was, there was no sign of the creature anywhere, and I was happy about that. And the guy saw me looking around, and he looked at me, and he didn't say anything. And I started to say something, and he put his finger up to his mouth. I said, okay, I'm not going to say anything. So we were driving through, and right before, well, we left North Carolina. We took 64 to 32, and then we were in Virginia back by the Great Dismal Swamp. And we went to Suffolk, eventually Norfolk. Uh, a few times I thought 
I saw some creatures running along the side with the truck, but that was probably my imagination. When I looked, they weren't there. But uh, when I did, right before I left, I slowed down, and I stopped, and I looked back at the swamp, and, and I almost swear that I saw a dog man in the swamp watching me leave. Now, that didn't make me feel good either. So the experience has made me much more aware of my surroundings. I look over my shoulder a lot. I examine the woods thoroughly at all times. I guess that's good. I thought I was doing that, but I guess it wasn't. So I went about and I, I researched the phenomenon for a long time. It may seem that I, I may have opened myself up a little bit, but maybe I didn't. I mean, must have been there all the time. So after a while, I got brave enough to tell my story to my two best friends, and they teased me a little bit, but they knew me well enough to know I was serious. One of them spends a lot of time outdoors, and his property backs up to a large wooded area on the outskirts of Lake Nakamixon, which is about 30 miles north of Philadelphia. And he started to tell me that he had some strange occurrences on his property. He said he wanted to tell me about it after I told him my story. He thought people would think he was crazy, but now he felt comfortable enough. His property is regularly shaped in about 20 acres, I'd say. And as I said, it's attached to a large park surrounding a reservoir. The area's got a real long history. It's sacred to the tribe of Native Americans that live there. And there's a bunch of stone structures nearby in the lands, and there's a couple roads named after them. So he began to tell me that over the last month, he started hearing strange noises at the back of his property. He didn't have a large fence, just enough to mark the property. And his dogs were actually pretty friendly, so the fence wasn't really meant for them. It's just to mark things out. So he was hearing snarling and, and baying in the back, like wild dogs. And uh, in the back of his property, he had the shed that he used to process deer. And it was damaged. Somebody had broken into it. But it was scratched and clawed and torn up, and he didn't think that was human damage. So he had repaired it, but something broke in again. So he decided to watch the house with binoculars and see what was disturbing the shed. He thought it might be a bear, but there's no bear in the, in the county. I, mean, I guess it's not unheard of, but there wasn't. So he started watching, and one night the surrounding forest, of course, got quiet, just that whole thing, and, and his dogs, who are usually very alert, put their heads down, put their tails between their legs, and ran down the basement. He said, uh-oh. So he was watching the shed with binoculars, and he thought he saw a shadow move. And, and as he watched, he swore that he saw a wolf-like creature, his words, walking on two legs. So he said he shook his head, and he said the sight scared him a bit, more than anything he can remember. And he considered going out with a shotgun, but he, he thought better of it. The next day, he went out to the shed, and the dogs peened pretty normally. He didn't see any damage, but he found some tracks. So he told me this story, and I went out to the house with him. And we looked at the shed. And, and there were people hiking around and stuff during the day, and everything seemed pretty normal. So that night, we, we built a fire, and we sat in his backyard, and we were watching. And we didn't see anything. but there were a couple of times during the night that insects stopped and there was that weird, eerie feeling like we were being watched. So I told him I had an idea. I told him to start processing his deer somewhere else. Kind of a pain, but if he was going to continue living there, I think that it might be better. So we cleaned the shed, wiped down with bleach solution, and repurposed it. And after that, the activity kind of stopped. I don't know whether they disappeared, but the activity stopped. We didn't feel it again. So I think he's pretty fortunate because in my heart, when I had my encounter and what I saw, I think once they were there, they were going to stay. And I don't know, you know, maybe they would follow you home. And that's a real sobering thought. It's strange how you can tell the difference between a Bigfoot, a predator, human, dogman. Each one has a, a completely different feeling, but the dog man to me holds like a, a kind of a terror feeling, like the alligator, but much worse. 
It's almost like an instinctual fear. But I never really saw it on the other two trips or on my friend's property, but my senses told me that it was the same feeling that I had in the Allegheny National Park. I have to say that I've had that feeling a couple times, too, in, in rather small patches of woods, surprisingly, near Philadelphia. That sounds really creepy, but when you know you're being watched, and I know the feeling now. So, again, I'm hoping that you can follow me home. <laughs> so, we still love to go camping and be out in the woods, but I'm always very wary, even if I don't tell my wife that I'm wary. I want her to relax and have a good time. I'm always armed, something 357 or higher, and she's pretty used to that anyway. Uh, we tend to stay up north a bit more, and uh, as it seems to be not as prevalent there. I'll tell you what, Dave, for you to continue camping the way you do, travel trailer or not, you've got to have some serious sand. How close were these dogmen to you when you first saw them that night? I'd say, though, the first one I saw... I'd say he was about 20, 25 yards maximum. Yeah, I'd say about 20 yards. Slightly downhill. At their closest, how close did they get? Well, I don't make a habit of shooting things, but when I shot him, he was less than 10 yards from me. Ooh, yeah, that's way too close for comfort. That's why I shot him. (laughs) You know, I might have even considered a warning shot. But again, I thought I knew, you know, I don't think a warning shot's going to do this guy any good at all. And I didn't like the way he looked at all. I mean, I mean, it wasn't just the look, obviously, the way he looked, but I didn't, when he showed his teeth at me, I said, well, that's it. It was kind of a live or die moment, I thought. So him or me, it's going to be him, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, I can't say I'll blame you there. After going through an experience like that, it's no wonder he had all those nightmares that night. Wow. How did your wife react when you got back in the truck and told her about encountering that, as you put it, predator? Well, I didn't want to spook her because we still had a whole week of camping ahead of us. I mean, I still had a little presence of mind that way. But, you know, she was a little freaked out because she never really saw me scared like that before. I mean, not like that. I was literally shaking. My hands were shaking. Even though I was grabbing the wheel, my hands were shaking. But I told her kind of what I saw. And then as I was saying it and I was watching her eyes get bigger, I thought, well, maybe I'll just sugarcoat it a little bit. And I just told her it was a predator and I shot at it, Uh, you know, because I still wanted to camp the rest of the week. Believe me, the thought about turning around and going home was definitely in my mind, but I didn't think I wanted to give her the whole gory detail. Not at that time anyway. Yeah, if you had told her about what you had encountered that night, I don't think she would have agreed to go camping anymore after that, so I can understand. But it's funny, because you did still tell her the truth. You told her you encountered a predator, so there's no lie there. (laughs) It's true. Who handled your encounter better, you or your wife? Well, I guess I did the true encounter. I mean, I thought she did pretty well with my version of it afterward but you know i did eventually tell her about it and i don't think she handled it well at all actually and um i think i handled it better knowing that you know knowing about it and then still going back out and convincing her to go back out so i'd say it was me yeah it does sound that way how long did you wait to tell your wife about what you actually saw that night well i waited till we were comfortably back in the philadelphia area I waited till we were surrounded by civilization and everything seemed pretty safe as it was around us. And then I told her pretty much everything. I don't think I left much out. I mean, I I think I left out possibly the teeth and the eyes and my feelings about them, but I definitely described them to her. So probably about a week, let her settle in. It sounds like you did make a wise choice waiting that long to let her know about that. Waiting until you're home compared to telling her about what happened when you're still out there, that probably was a good move. Well, I think so. I mean, I really think that if I would have told her everything that I was feeling, we would have just been on the way home. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) we had a nice time, and that's good, and, and it was a great trip, but I think it would have been a rather short one if I went into detail. 
No, I'll bet you're right on that. You're especially haunted by a couple of things that happened that night. What are those things? Well, the eyes bother me, and, and that's kind of surprising to me because, you know, I'm used to seeing things in the woods and other places, canyons and plains, and, uh, you know, I've looked into the eyes of predators before, and it wasn't the same as this. They were very yellow, and there was a lot of light. There was a full moon that night, and there was a lot of, I guess, ambient light in the area. Even though it was swamp, there was quite a bit of light. Maybe it was reflecting off of the water. But these eyes were very bright and glowing, and uh, they had, I wouldn't say emotion, but they had intent, and that, that bothered me. The other thing that bothered me, besides, well, there was the, the teeth. When he showed his teeth, that was a shock to my system, kind of a ice pick to the stomach feeling. But I think the thing that bothered me the most is when he stood up on two feet. I mean, that was just so alien and so weird. I mean, if it was down on four legs, I could have maybe even dismissed it as a wolf. Wolf in the swamp? Eh. You know, I just read about the red wolf, but this was bigger than that. The red wolf was described as something much smaller. But when it stood up, I, I don't even think I could describe that feeling. It just kind of lurched up, and it seemed to settle in like it stopped and popped its legs into place. And those popping sounds, I swear, I can still hear them. It was the weirdest sound, and I'm looking at it in my mind right now as I'm telling you, the weirdest look, and and his eyes never left me. It wasn't like it distracted him to do it. He did it, and he was staring me dead on while he was doing it, as if, you know, I don't know, as if he thought I would be surprised by it. I don't know what he thought, but it, it, it really bothers me, and, and I can really honestly see it really clearly in my mind. Oh, I could understand why that would bother you. For those four dogmen, do you have any size estimates? I understand that you were in total shock, but any guesstimates on how big they were, height, how wide they were? Yeah, I was pretty surprised. I mean, I had a real good look at the one in front of me originally, and I had a pretty good look at the one that I thought was flanking. I saw the other two back there, but they were more shadowy than anything. I could see them moving seemed to be on all fours behind the other two, you know, two on each side coming up each side, and that, that was that was pretty scary, too, actually. Uh, I didn't know whether they were going to outrun me, come along the side of the truck. I mean, that was, anyway, I'd say the first guy, he was 25 yards away, slightly downhill. When he stood up, I'd probably put him at like six or seven feet, easy, seven feet. The one that was on all fours coming around the side. I guess if he would have stood up, he wouldn't have been much shorter, but I think he was slightly smaller. And the other two, I don't think I saw them well enough to give a height estimate, but they, you know, they all seem to be about the same size. So, seven feet, standing straight up, which is kind of alien to begin with. You think about a four-legged creature, but, I mean, some of my dogs are pretty big if, if I get them up on two feet but not that big. That had to be quite the sight to see. Do you wish you had done anything differently when you had that encounter? I don't know. I mean, part of me wants to have maybe done more damage, but part of me says no because I got away. I mean, maybe if it developed differently, it would have been different, but maybe I shouldn't have gotten out of the truck. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> but uh, I guess that's, that's pretty moot. Yeah, maybe that was the one thing I shouldn't have gotten out of the truck. But I really can't, you know, everything happened so quickly and developed along uh, a timeline that was almost predetermined. I mean, it seemed to be marking time from the time I saw him to the time I got in the truck. Maybe it was practice behavior on their part but it seemed like they were moving, I was retreating, and that was it. So I don't know what I could have done differently. Yeah, judging from your conversation with the man in the parking lot, it sounds like encountering people is almost routine for them, so maybe they did have some sort of a routine down for when that sort of thing happened. It's a scary thought. Yes, it is. <laughs> Very unsettling and scary. 
You're surprised by the fact they were in the Alligator National Forest. Why is that? Well, I mean, the swamp isn't a place I would think there would be a large canine population. One, it's not entirely too far from civilization. It's a well-traveled area. It is a national forest, so I would think that there's park rangers and various environmentalists around. Also, there's alligators, and to me, I would think that some predators would avoid an alligator. I mean, from what I have read about them or I know about them is they're a pretty stealthy hunter on their own, and I don't think I want to tangle with them, and I'm not sure whether anything else would, but it did surprise me that they were there. I mean, I guess I don't know where they would be at home, <laughs> but but it did surprise me. Well, unfortunately, you'll find them in all sorts of places you wouldn't expect to see them. It's just the way it is. Yeah. Well, I was pretty surprised that I thought it was 30 miles north of Philadelphia. You know, that area that I was with with my friend was not exactly the wilderness. I mean, maybe it felt that way when you're in the woods, but a 10-minute walk in one direction and you're in the suburbs. So that was pretty weird. Well, don't lose sight of the fact that they do come into the suburbs and they've actually been seen inside the city limits of major cities like Cincinnati and Chicago. So that's been done before. That's scary, too. (laughs) Yes, it is. Yes, it is. They don't have any soft edges to them, that's for sure. You didn't think anyone had been attacked by dogmen before we talked for the first time. Why did you think that? Well, I think I would have heard about it. I don't hear a lot about it as it is. It seems like there's kind of a, I don't want to say censor, but there seems to be a a lack of information out there about dogmen, whereas there seems to be a lot of information about other cryptids like Bigfoot and some of the lake monsters and things like that. You tend to hear about them, but you don't hear a lot about this one. And if they were violent and people were getting hurt, I think we'd hear about it. So I was surprised to hear that there had been violent encounters. When they do attack, they almost always seem to do it from behind with a massive downward blow. Do you think one could have been behind you that you didn't see that night setting you up for an attack like that? Yeah, I think it's a real good possibility. I was very concerned about an attack, actually, even though I say I'm surprised by it. Their behavior said to me hunting, because I had hunted, and I know what I would do if I was going to flush something out or if I wanted to set something up. And so I had the guy in front of me holding my attention. There was a guy flanking to one side. Behind me was my trailer. I mean, it's a big, you know, nine-foot-tall trailer, so... Something could have been behind me very easily, and I had no idea it was there. And I was at the north end of the swamp. The road cuts across the north end of it, and there's probably maybe a couple of miles from the road to the top of the peninsula. And then the rest of the park goes back probably another, I don't know, 30 or 40 miles maybe. I don't know if it's that much, but quite a bit of territory, and anything could have been back there. So... I mean, I guess he would have had to come around the trailer or between the truck and the trailer because I did pass by the hitch. That would have been a, now that I think about it, that would have been a perfect ambush point, but very possible and uh, another unsettling feeling for sure. Well, I definitely hope there wasn't one back there trying to sneak up on you like that, but it's definitely possible there just might have been. They didn't seem to be there to play cards let's put it that way (laughs) (laughs) they were they were not there you know just in fact not even just to skip i thought you know afterward that they might have just been trying to scare me out of their territory but it it seemed worse than that it really did i mean if that was the case maybe it would have been different you know maybe it would have just been a lot of noise and growling and flailing about but this was kind of a if i hadn't noticed them I mean, it was kind of stealthy, so, you know, that might have been the case. If you wouldn't have seen them, it sure does make you wonder how that would have played out. I hope it was just a bluff and they weren't looking to take you out, but I guess we'll never know. Yeah, well, my back was to them to begin with, 
you know, I was checking the trailer out, and I felt the presence behind me and turned around. So if I hadn't turned around, I don't know. I don't know. Well, thank goodness you did turn around. <laughs> yeah, me too. I mean, that's the way I feel. I mean, that's what happens. I think a lot of predators, they do that. They set the prey up that way. And if I think about it as myself as the prey. But then again, a lot of creatures have a sixth sense at some time in their lives or in their makeup where a lot of things are aware and will turn around even when a predator is approaching. So who knows if they have a, a routine as far as that goes. Well, thank goodness your instincts didn't fail you that night. In the pre-interview, you mentioned that you've noticed that the Sasquatch phenomenon is much more commonly accepted than the Dogman phenomenon. Is that a source of frustration for you? Yeah, I think it is. You know, frustration maybe not have been the word I would have used prior, but it is now when I start to think that I'd like to get involved with research. I mean, I guess it took a long time for the Bigfoot phenomenon to gain the acceptance that it has. Back in, you know, the 60s and 70s, it was still kind of a joke, and, and now it seems to have a pretty widespread appeal. And it is frustrating that there almost seems to be a censorship surrounding the Dogman encounter and a lot of, uh, you know, Wolfman jokes and things like that, and people not taking it seriously. And I guess there's still a lot of people who don't take Bigfoot seriously either. I mean, and that's another thing. I try not to call it that. I try and call it Sasquatch just to give it a more dignified name. But in the same way, people seem to ignore it a bit. Maybe it just needs to, and, and this is probably a horrible way to say this, but needs to come out more into the spotlight to be recognized more and then it will gain more acceptance. But I'm not sure I want that to happen. So, I mean, uh, you know kind of a jagged edge on that, but I think that it's the same thing. People see things, and they're not crazy. I mean, I guess some people are, but most people are, are you know, stand-up guys and, and women and, and, and children and, and all kinds of people that are regular human beings that see these things. They come out and they tell people about it, and they're, they're not telling you because they want to be ridiculed. They're telling you because they want you to know what they saw. And if somebody's telling you they saw a canine on two legs, that's pretty scary. And I would hope that people would take that seriously, but I guess it's going to take some time. It is very scary. It is a dichotomy also, on one hand, for them to be more readily accepted by the general public, more encounters have to happen. On the other hand, more encounters would have to happen for that to be the case. So yeah. it really is a catch-22. Sort of like the, like installing the red light in a dangerous intersection. How many accidents do you have to have before the light goes in? It's kind of the same thing. Yeah, that's a good comparison. Do you get frustrated when you hear skeptics give reasons why creatures like dogmen can't exist? Absolutely. But then again, it depends on their point of view. If they were out there and saw what we saw, and researched, or even if they didn't research, if they just had an encounter, I can't see how they would remain skeptics. So, in my mind, a skeptic, a lot of times, is someone that's standing behind science or standing behind a preconception or maybe maybe even a, a, a learned position saying this doesn't exist because of this. But if they were out there, and they saw with their own two eyes. It would be hard to stand behind those criticisms, I would think. Kind of like a, a friend of mine who's a doctor who was very much against any kind of painkillers or pain relievers for his patients until he had a serious accident and had to go through some surgeries. And then overnight, he was a proponent of narcotics. So... <laughs> It's kind of the same thing. If you experience it, it's going to change your viewpoint. So in my mind, my experience, I think that a lot of skeptics and critics that haven't been out there and haven't seen it or come close or even brushed up against it don't really have what they need 
to pull it down so hard. It's funny how that surgeon you mentioned felt about painkillers until he needed them himself. Right. It's pretty much the same thing, I would think. Yeah, I'd say it is. How intelligent do you think dogmen are now that you've had a chance to see them in action? Well, it's hard to say. I mean, I guess maybe if I had more experience than just one type of behavior, but, you know, at least canine intelligence and the experience I have with dog training, I'd say that a German Shepherd has the intelligence of maybe a four or five-year-old child, So, and that's nothing to scoff at. So I'd say they're very intelligent as far as it goes, maybe even more than we know. It's hard to say, but they're definitely displayed hunting behavior and coordination, so that's got to take something. I think that I, I don't think I'd want to pit myself against them if <laughs> That's another way of putting it. I mean, I know that, that a grown man or woman with their faculties is pretty much superior to most things on the planet as far as intelligence, but some things are better at other things than we are. So as far as intelligence, I would say they are. Very. <laughs> well, we'll never know for sure, but I think they are a lot more intelligent than most people would ever be comfortable knowing. A lot going on there. They, besides the hunting behavior, besides the coordination of attack, I think that they can work things out. Problem solving, and anything that's problem solving has a higher intelligence than you would think. You know, chimpanzee level. Just the fact that, for whatever reason, it's deciding to move on two legs is almost requiring an intelligence to do so. I would think. There's got to be an advantage there, and I guess you'd have to think about that. Oh, I'd say so. You're dealing with your dogman encounter better than most people would. What do you attribute that to? Well, I have spent a lot of time out in the wilds by myself and with others. And I really feel like the encounter instilled more of a curiosity than a fear over time. At first, I was scared, and scared at a, a real base level. But over time, I just became more and more curious about what this thing could possibly be, where it came from, how it's manifesting itself at this point. And my time in the woods has made me more experienced outside, in my mind anyway. And my curiosity for things like that, and also the fact that, of the way I think. I mean, I don't really scare that easily, and I tend to want to try to work things out in my mind and come to grips with them on a um, an ordered basis. And in order to do that, I have to eliminate fear from the equation. Speaking of you spending time out in the woods, how has your behavior in the woods changed now that you know they're out there? I'd like to say it hasn't, but it has. I would wish that it hadn't changed because I think I was a little happier before I knew they were there. Happier is kind of a strange word to use, but I guess I was a little less concerned in the woods. I had mentioned that I I think that well that there's that, that I didn't th well I didn't think there's a lot of things that can really really harm you, you know, besides a, a, a large predator in the woods, but now I've changed that idea. I've been researching and looking for Bigfoot in the woods, and even that has not frightened me that much. The initial encounter, that first time I saw one, well, probably the only time I saw one, but it initially scared me, but then I, again, became curious, and now I'm, I'm ultra-curious. But with this guy, I'm definitely looking over my shoulder. When I go into the woods, I usually scan them pretty well, now I'm scanning them maybe 10 times more than I was. And I'm looking at them a little differently and checking shadows where I didn't before and possible hiding places and high ground and things I wouldn't have done before, but I'm doing it now. And if I'm camping, I'll settle in, but I'll still keep aware of my surroundings. And if I get up and go out, I'm going to check just a little bit more than I would have. It's not going to keep me out of the woods, but it's going to make me want to check them out a lot more and scrutinize my surroundings more. 
your response and mindset after having the experiences you've had with these things, it's totally understandable. I mean, with dogmen like the ones you ran into that night, there is no middle ground. You're not going to have any type of uh, an understanding with them. That's just not going to happen. With Sasquatch, I guess, on some occasions, you might be able to have some form of a middle ground. So that all does make good sense. I think you're absolutely correct. I think that it's a different entity entirely. And in some ways, I think we have to give one more of a birth or a respect than the other. And I don't mean that on a species level. I mean, on a species level, I should say. I mean, it's not that I would lose respect for Sasquatch, but yes, I think there could be a middle ground with them and there could be a communication factor with them. But I don't think there's any communication factor with, with the dogman phenomenon. I can't imagine there would be. Not from my experience. Maybe somebody else has another idea about that. But as far as I'm concerned, it's either you're in their sight or you're not. <laughs> and I think being in their sights is not a good thing. Are you surprised by the fact you've become so fascinated by the topic now that you've had that encounter? No, I don't think I'm surprised. If I'm surprised by anything, I think it would be maybe my level of interest because my interest in Sasquatch is pretty high, and I'm, I'm interested in finding out more about them and, and researching them in their habitat and possibly having more encounters. Whereas with the Dogman, yes, I'm interested in them, and I'm interested in what makes them tick, but I'm not sure I'm interested in having more one-on-one -on -one encounters with them. That makes sense. You're a self-proclaimed dog person, Dave. You were surprised by the fact that there was no communication between you and those dog men. Please tell us more about your feelings on that. Yeah, well, you know, I have trained dogs over the years. I've trained my dogs. I've trained dogs for other people. And I do feel a connection to the dog. I think there's definitely a way to communicate with canines and ones they understand quite well. They're definitely a pack behavior with an alpha at the head of that pack, and they understand that quite well. And they're quite loyal in that surrounding. And with the training, I have definitely communicated with dogs extremely well. They can understand me, I can understand them, and it's a very nice relationship. When I encountered the dog man, there was none of that. There was no chance at communication. He looked at me, and and he was not seeing someone he wanted to communicate with. He wasn't seeing someone he wanted to share emotions with. I don't even know if he had emotions. He looked at me either as intruder or food was the look I got. And um, I don't think I was going to change that view in any way. I certainly wasn't going to talk to him in a funny voice and have him respond to it. <laughs> no. It definitely, definitely surprised me. In some ways, and didn't surprise me in others. I mean, I guess I wouldn't talk that way to a wolf in the wild either. But this was a little different. This, this was, this was a very focused gaze, and it wasn't friendly at all. Yeah, I don't think trying to baby talk those dogmen that night would have had the desired effect. Like if you were <laughs> trying to baby talk one of your German shepherds or something like that. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd say not. Do you think going on that BFRO expedition opened you up to experiences such as your dogman encounter and other things? Well, I'm not sure if I can say that any experience on its own would open a person up to more things, but I think that the person themselves may open up because they feel connected more because they look at things differently. And it definitely made me look at things differently, and the more I look at things differently, the more I see, and the more I see, the more experiences I have. So, yes, it did open me up to more. Where whatever the reason or the method or the, the circumstance that went around for that to happen, yes, it definitely opened me up, I would say. You know, Dave, it's funny how when something like that that's so traumatic and so awful happens in your life, at the moment, it's hard to glean anything positive from that experience, but 
I really do believe it's really hard to find any experience that you're going to have in life that's all bad. And almost any experience that you're going to have, I really do believe that you can get at least one positive thing out of it. That experience that you had that night, it did cause you to open up more and pay more attention to your surroundings and consequently get more out of life. Yeah, I think so. I mean, if anything, to look around more and enjoy your life and the surroundings of your life more just from being more aware of things, especially if they're not around. (laughs) Yeah, I'd say. You're scheduled to go on another BFRO expedition later this year. Do you have any trepidation about going on it after having that dogman encounter? No, I don't think I'd call it trepidation. Like I said before, I'm going to be more aware of my surroundings, and I'm going to survey them a little bit more than I normally would. But I think I said earlier that I'm not sure whether the two mix. I'm not sure whether we're going to find the two of them in the same place. I mean, I'm by no means an expert, quotation marks, on this. But if I'm going to go to an area that's a hotbed of Sasquatch activity, I'm not expecting to find them there. I'm hoping that it's going to be a completely different experience, and I'm I'm not really having any trepidation going into this. Well, that's good. At least after having these experiences, you can still get out there in the bush and still enjoy yourself, so that's a good thing. Tell us more about your interest in becoming a researcher for the North America Dogman Project. I'd like to hear more about that. Well, I had looked around at a lot of different cryptozoological organizations. There are plenty of them out there, and I suppose that you could have an interest in many things at once. I looked at a few, and and I saw that I liked a lot of the things that I saw on the website, and I had heard a couple of interviews from the people in the group, and and it sounded like something that I wanted to become part of because I'd already been interested. And uh, my interest grows, if, if anything, and, you know, a situation or an encounter like I had I mean, some people might go the other way. This has actually made me more interested in it. And what I said before is there seems to be like a lockdown on the information about Dogman. And I feel that it needs to get out there. We need to have more researchers in the field. We need to have more people working on this to bring it to light even more than it is. I definitely want to be involved in that and be one of those people. I think that I have the right mindset for it. I think that I have a lot of interest and um, I'm not particularly fearful of moving into the unknown. I think I have the same respect for the outdoors and the unknown, but at the same time, I want to find out and I want to go out and I want to take a look at it and see what we can bring to light. I'll tell you what, Dave, if we had more researchers out there in the field like you, I think we would definitely be a lot more successful. So I wish you nothing but the best on that. And so that you know, I'm going to reach out to Jody Cook and let him know about your interest in becoming a member of his organization and hopefully help see this through. Well, I appreciate that. I'm definitely interested. I definitely um, want to contribute as much as I can. I think that we need to take a good look at this even more than we are. and get people more interested in more than just one thing. I really like your outlook on all this. Well, before we wrap this show, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Well, I think people need to be a little bit more aware when they go out into the woods. I don't want to scare anybody. I want to inject a lot of fear into a place that people don't want it to be because the outdoors and the national parks and camping and All the outdoor sports are meant to be enjoyed, and I don't think we should be out there looking over our shoulders with any kind of a trepidation about doing what we enjoy. But at the same time, I think just like anywhere you go, anywhere on a city street or in your own neighborhood, driving, boating, wherever it might be, I think that you just need to be aware of your surroundings a little bit more. I think things are changing in the world, and maybe it's because we're opening up more areas that 
have been closed in the past, and we're exposing more things that we haven't had contact with before. Whatever the reason, I just think that when people go out there, do the things that they love doing, they just need to be a little bit more aware of the surroundings. Very well said. Very good words. Well, Dave, I can't thank you enough for coming on and sharing the details of that experience with us and everything else that you shared with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vic. I really appreciate the chance to come on and talk to you. Oh, you know you're more than welcome. Have a great night. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Bye. Bye.